Hey everyone, Ryan here and welcome back to the Prostodontic series. This video we will talk about mechanical properties. So there's going to be a lot of definitions, but I'm going to try to tie in a lot of clinical applications and examples to make everything relevant. So our first definition is compressive strength. And this refers to the ability of a material to resist fracture during compression. Now this image, the arrows depict the application of force. So think of a crown withstanding the pounding of occlusal forces from opposing dentition. That would be an example of compressive strength. Tensile strength is the ability to resist fracture, but during pulling. So it's like compressive strength. We're talking about the ability to resist fracture, but instead of the force arrows pointing towards the material, they're now pulling away from that material. And flexural strength is our third version, and that's the ability to resist fracture during bending. So think of this like the pontic and especially the connector of a bridge during occlusal function. All right, our next definition is fracture toughness. And this refers to the ability of a material to resist the propagation of a crack. And zirconia has the best fracture toughness. And it's a prime example of fracture toughness. Now zirconia, as a material, has this characteristic known as transformation toughening. And it has to do with how well it is at resisting the propagation of a crack. So zirconia is the strongest ceramic and the least likely to fracture because of this unique ability. And basically, the tetragonal particles that normally constitute zirconia transform into a stronger monolithic particle in response to cracks, so the crack does not propagate. It's a complex and incredible process, and zirconia is what I would link fracture toughness with. So if you see a question referencing the propagation of a crack, they're probably hinting at zirconia. All right, let's spend some time unpacking the modulus of, of elasticity, or the elastic modulus. Although it's called the elastic modulus, it's actually a measure of stiffness. So this is a stress-strain curve that directly relates to the modulus of elasticity. Stress is on the y-axis, and stress is the internal distribution of a load, basically the force that an object feels. Strain is on the x-axis, and strain is the internal distortion produced by that load, basically how much the object changes shape. So the straight line part of the graph here represents elastic deformation, which means once the stress is released, the object will return back to its original shape. The curved part of the graph represents plastic deformation, which means that even when the stress is released, the object remains deformed and does not return back to its original shape. So the elastic modulus is related to the elastic deformation part or the straight line part of the graph. And mathematically, it's measured as stress divided by strain. Now there's another way we can think of it. We can think of it as stress or the y component of this graph so the change in y divided by strain, or the change in x, which is equal to the slope of that line. So in other words, the slope is the elastic modulus. So the steeper the slope in this graph, the stiffer the material. And the shallower the slope, the more elastic that item would be. So a ceramic material like porcelain would be very, very stiff. 
whereas a rubber band, for instance, would be a much shallower line and would be much more elastic by definition. So we can unpack some more of the terms in the stress strain graph. And something that's very brittle means that it fractures easily without substantial dimensional changes. And now porcelain is a prime example. Porcelain is very stiff and even with lots of stress. So as this graph climbs up and up, we're applying more and more stress. You can see how it doesn't move a whole lot in the X direction. The ceramic, the porcelain does not change a whole lot as it's experiencing more and more stress, just like a crown experiences during occlusal function. It doesn't deform or change shape that much, but after a certain amount of stress, we get to the fracture point, and after a certain amount of stress, the crown will fracture and break. So remember, porcelain is a type of ceramic, but not all ceramics are porcelain. Ductility refer refers to an object that deforms easily under tensile strength. So something that's ductile can experience significant dimensional changes without breaking. And you can see how it's, this red line is so much different than the blue line in that the curved part of the graph is much, much longer. And so that maybe it can't withstand as much stress, but in this zone of stress, it can bend a whole, whole lot. And so uh, orthodontic wires are a prime example of something that's very ductile. Now I do want to say ductility is slightly different from elasticity. Remember, elasticity refers to the first part of this graph when we we're talking about the elastic modulus and elastic deformation. Deformation or a change in shape would spring back after force is released in this part of the graph. So again, a rubber band would be a prime example of something being very elastic. Ductility refers to deformation that doesn't spring back, so that plastic deformation, that curved part of the graph, as opposed to the elastic deformation. But if something is ductile, it also doesn't break easily under tensile strength, and this part of the graph is pretty long. And that's part of the reason orthodontic wires are so useful clinically, because you can take advantage of them, of them being both ductile and elastic. Now the next term is malleability. This is similar to ductility, except now, instead of deforming easily under tensile strength, it deforms easily under compressive strength. And that's a good distinction to know for the board exam, just one word difference there. And gold is a prime example of a material that's malleable. All right, next we have percentage elongation. And this is a funny way of saying the ability of a material to be burnished. Now burnishing is the plastic deformation of a surface due to sliding contact with another object. So burnishing a Toffelmeyer or a sectional matrix band against the adjacent tooth when doing a class two restoration is a good practice for obtaining a solid proximal contact. And how you do so is you rub this ball burnisher from side to side and up and down against the matrix band. And that's an example of burnishing something. So burnishing occurs when the stress on an object exceeds the yield strength of that material. And yield strength simply denotes the force that an object can withstand before it starts permanently deforming. Basically the part of the graph that transitions from straight to curved. So when the stress applied exceeds that point in the graph, the material starts to give and burnish. And gold is another material that can be burnished rather easily. This is useful if you have a crown where the margin is slightly open, you can burnish that margin against the tooth prep to close that margin. All right, next we have the coefficient of thermal expansion, another, another complicated mechanical property. This one measures the fractional change in size 
per degree change in temperature. In other words, how much a material shrinks or expands with a change in temperature. So the higher the coefficient of thermal expansion, the more tendency to change with changes in temperature. So a possible break in the marginal seal of any restoration becomes imminent when there is a marked difference between the tooth and restorative material. So the tooth, this is just a universal number. The general average tooth has a coefficient of thermal expansion of 11.4. Now this is an arbitrary number, but we can compare it to other materials. And the closer we can get a material to this number, that means with changes in temperature, the tooth and whatever material we're talking about will shrink and expand fairly evenly and uniformly. So if you compare the tooth having 11.4 and composite at 30, well, if the oral cavity were to get very, very hot, the composite's going to expand much more so than the tooth will because its coefficient of thermal expansion is much higher. Also, if the oral cavity were to get very, very cold, the tooth would shrink less than the composite because again, the composite has a higher coefficient of thermal expansion, which means it's changing more in size per degree change in temperature, whether hotter or colder. So again, gold is the best material here because it's closest to the coefficient of thermal expansion of a tooth. So one way I like to remember this order, composite, metal, tooth, then ceramic, and that's from the highest coefficient of thermal expansion to the lowest, is by using this acronym COTE. And so I remember C for composite, that comes first. Then this one's a little bit funky, but I put an O for metal. And so the O lines up with of. And then T for tooth, which lines up with thermal. And then ceramic, the E in ceramic, lining up with expansion. So C-O-T-E, you just remember C-O-T-E. And that's the order from greatest to least coefficient of thermal expansion. And a question that could, that could ask you to rank these or ask which material is higher than another material is certainly feasible to pop up on the board exam. So if you remember this, it can help you in that situation. So if we put everything together, what are the desirable mechanical properties specifically for a metal alloy used routinely in prosthodontics? Well, we want something with good compressive strength, tensile strength, and flexural strength. Of course, we don't want things to be breaking. So having a high yield strength means that it does not permanently deform easily. A high elastic modulus means that something stiff, remember, has a steep slope in that stress-strain curve, and it does not flex easily. We want something that's accurate when casting, so gold is more accurate than, say, a base metal, like we talked about in the last video on metal alloys. And we'll talk specifically about the casting process when we talk about lab processing of crowns in a later video. Also, just like we talked about in the last slide, the coefficient of thermal expansion should be close to that of the tooth, so they change relative to one another pretty similarly with a change in temperature. We want there to be biocompatibility, so we should be aware that some people have nickel and beryllium allergies. We want something that's resistant to corrosion and something that's around less than 45% noble alloy means that it's likely to tarnish in the oral cavity. So the more noble something is, the more corrosion resistance it has and something that offers minimal wear to the opposing dentition. Uh, we talked about this a little bit earlier on in the prosthodontics uh, series, that porcelain will wear natural teeth much faster than acrylic or gold or even zirconia. So in many ways, as you can see, gold is the best material for restorative dentistry. But ceramics are getting better and better with the advent of zirconia, and composites continue to evolve and improve over time as well. 
So that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. If you're interested in supporting me, check out my Patreon page. A huge thank you to Michael Raja and all of my patrons for their support. You can unlock extras like access to my video slides to take notes on and practice questions. So go check that out. The link is in the description. Thanks so much for watching everyone. I'll see you all in the next video.